Thank you, Tracy. Well, thank all of you for uh, making this your last stop, well, before the Boston Cocktails for your day. Hope you all had a great day. I wanted to ask how many folks here, maybe as a child, as a teenager, or as an adult, maybe even taking your own children, how many people here have been to the Museum of Science and Industry? Wow. Wow, that's pretty good. Well, if you've been, I'm sure you won't want to miss this evening's uh, uh, event at the museum. And if you haven't been, I'd especially urge you to uh, make the bus ride and, and join us for that. Um, I'd like to have the uh, panelists that are going to help us present this case study introduce themselves. And we'll start here with Jerry. Hi, my name is Jerry Hulk, and I'm the IT Infrastructure Manager at the Museum of Science and Industry. My name is Troy Suddeth. I'm the Director of Engineering and Services for Corning Wireless. Hi, Russell Vest, a little bit too close to the mic, with Exonet Systems on the business development side. And so I worked with Jerry at MSI to pull all the pieces together in the front end. Thanks, guys. And I'm Tim Ayers. I'm the uh, Vice President of Global Services at Exonet Systems. And uh, we're delighted to uh, take a few minutes here and tell you a little bit about the museum project. And we'll start with Jerry. Um, this is an iconic, historic landmark facility and museum, a very popular attraction uh, for North America and the world. And Jerry, before we talk about the solution, tell us a little bit about the museum. Sure. So um, as I said, I'm, I'm the IT manager at the museum. And, and though that's my primary function, I've been with the museum for 26 years. So I know a little bit of the history. Um, so the, the museum building is the only building remaining from the 1893 World's Columbian Exposition. It was rebuilt in the 30s and opened in 1933 as the Museum of Science and Industry. Since that time, we've had 180 million guests come through our doors. So quite, uh, quite a popular attraction, about 2 million people a year. Um, we are the largest science center in the Western Hemisphere. And what does that bring us? About, let me, a couple of stats here. 400,000 square feet of exhibit space. It's about 10 acres. It's a lot of exhibit space. Um, the Chicagoland's only five-story dome theater. We have um, a, a student and teacher e-learning center with video conferencing in HD. We have an 800-seat auditorium and smaller theaters throughout the building. 12 learning labs to support teacher and student education programs. Um, so the education is, is very important to us. Our, our um, vision is really to inspire and motivate our children to achieve their fullest potential in STEM, science, technology, medicine, engineering. Um, do that through interactive, through fun exhibits. We also do that through our Center for the Advancement of Science Education. Um, they, this is an accredited program that trains teachers, does student programs, after school programs, community uh, at school programs, as well as develop the programs which interact with our guests every day. Thanks, Jerry. So, a little context on the facility. It's almost 120 years since that facility was first built. It's been repurposed back in the 30s to its current use. Um, it's a historic building. We'll talk a little bit more about all that as we talk about the solution. But before we talk about the technical part of the solution, Jerry, what, what led the, the Museum of Science and Industry to think about bringing an indoor distributed network to the museum? What was, what was the challenge you were trying to uh, meet? Sure. Uh, so we're the Museum of Science and Industry. We, we are a leader in development of um, science and technology education. And we recognize the, the rapid growth of, of tablets, smartphones. I've got mine. Um, I'm sure all of you do as well. And to be able to support learning and education through those platforms, um, required something we didn't have. In this old building, we had many, many areas of the building that had no cellular reception whatsoever. My office, I couldn't get a, I couldn't get a bar. And I'm not that deep into the, into the bowels of the institution. So it really was a challenge to be able to engage our, our uh, customers, our guests, and our students 
through digital uh, initiatives. Great. So very poor coverage, really no way to bring things into this digital age. Nope. Um, let's talk a little bit about the solution itself and I'll, I'll point this question to Troy but really open it up to anyone. Um, Troy, tell us a little bit about the solution and, and let's get a little technical and engineering here about the solution that we, we worked with the museum uh, to bring into the museum. Sure, thanks. So the requirement was for a neutral host DAS. Um, it had to support the uh, four primary commercial uh, bands, 700, cell, PCS, and AWS. Uh, the requirement was uh, for it to be CISO day one. Uh, we arrived at uh, three sectors and um, the RF target for the solution was to be dominant over the macro by a certain figure. I think in this case it was 8 dB. The solution that was chosen was the MA2000 QX. It's the uh, quad band dedicated amplifier. Um, there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, there was one primary uh, wireless service provider that was going to be on air day one. So um, a dedicated amplifier approach allows you to um, have, you know, from a technical perspective, uh, the greatest amount of scalability and control for that operator. Um, across, you know, for their dedicated head end and, and uh, remote amplifier uh, components across a shared infrastructure. So the economics come into play that, you know, on day one, as a low cost uh, entry into the neutral host DAS, you have one amplifier that's going to serve the needs of one operator across, again, the cable, coax, antennas, um, that'll be able to support future carriers as they grow. So with a dedicated approach, the second carrier joins, they bring their electronics. So, so that was the approach here. Uh, the, the power levels for um, the MA2000 system uh, met the targets that uh, were required based on uh, what we saw from the, the macro system. Um, this venue has a variety of morphologies, as we like to call it. You've got an exhibit hall, you've got, uh, as, as Jerry mentioned, you've got uh, auditoriums, uh, office space, uh, parking garage, there's a large uh, underground parking area that needed to be covered. And a submarine. And there's a submarine area too, which, are we going to be able to sneak into that? Or, no? Okay. We'll have to see. U505, uh, code name. The, uh, so, so that mix of morphologies required a mix of uh, different antenna types, um, a, a mix of omni and uh, panel, and we went with the approach of having two port antennas, antennas that could support MIMO out of the same enclosure, out of the same antenna, and we ran cable uh, to, to those. Uh, so we've got two runs of, of coax to these MIMO antennas um, to be able to support MIMO day two. I mean, one thing we don't want to do in a in a venue that's got this much aesthetic concern is to have to rip and replace or rip and add equipment later and uh, certainly um, we probably won't be allowed to do that. So this allows us the, the ability to turn on MIMO uh, later on. So yeah, overall after the design was completed, the performance of the system when the signal sources were set up was um, ideal. Uh, it was a success from a coverage perspective. From an LTE perspective uh, across 700 and AWS, we saw downlink speeds of um, between 30 and, and 70 megabits per second, depending 700 or AWS, and um, 15 to 30 megabits upload. So uh, by, by all accounts, a successful deployment. Great, thank you. And I'll open this up to, to everybody because I think as we, we had a chance to talk beforehand, you, you all had some great points. You know, Jerry started us off by talking about the historic nature of the facility. Troy just touched on some of the aesthetic uh, uh, um, considerations. Let's talk for a little bit about the challenges and the considerations that went into the design and the implementation of this network in this type of a facility. Well, I think um, one of our biggest challenges is that the Museum of Science and Industry is open uh, seven days a week, 363 days a year. So it's, um, it's, it's not like we had downtime in which uh, that they can come in and do this installation. Um, at 9.30 in the morning, guests started coming in the door and uh, we had to be ready to go and we had to um, give them the best uh, seamless and unobstructed uh, um, experience that we could. So that was probably one of our biggest challenges um, from my perspective was being able to meet that. Secondly is, is the aesthetics of the museum, as, as everybody touched upon. This is a, 
you know, 100 plus year old building. The museum itself has been around for 80 years. We have some very iconic exhibits, um, including the U505, including science storms. And antennas couldn't, couldn't um, obstruct or intrude on that experience. So being able to make sure that, that we could present the, the experience to our guests that we wanted to is very important to us. Jerry, weren't the original drawings, weren't they, or the ones that, that I, the first ones that I saw at least were these huge prints dated back to the 1890s or something, and it so, said something like the Army of, uh, Army of Engineers, Corps. Corps of Engineers or something. Yeah, we, the, just, and, and they're still working today to update right. drawings. Our drawings are, are, you know, from original and, and updated and changed over the years and changed again over the years, and so that was uh, a challenge, I'm sure, for you. Well, it was a lot of fun, too. I mean, it's one of those drawings that you kind of want to put on your wall. I mean, it looks like an old map, if you will. Well, maybe for a geek, but uh, <laughs> that was certainly a challenge. And then the different composite materials of the walls and whatnot, right? We've got, we've got various kinds of uh, drywall inside, and we've got, was it limestone on the outside or something? And yeah, so think about, you know, even construction, if you live in an old house or an old building, um, some of them, there was huge masonry sub walls wrapped with old school, you know, uh, plaster and lath. On the outside of the building is all Indiana quarried limestone. So there were definitely some challenges construction-wise. I think um, we ran into some things during the implementation where the drawings absolutely did not match the actual um, facility and we ran into load-bearing walls and masonry walls that <laughs> didn't exist on the drawing. So I, I know a part of this project was being very nimble and being able to adapt both the design and the construction process um, on the fly as we encountered these. And I'll also add that to ensure we weren't disruptive to those two million visitors a year and the staff and the research and the student uh, visitors, we did this entire implementation during a maintenance window uh, Monday through Friday that was from uh, 4 a.m. to 9 a.m. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, yeah, 4 a.m. to 9 a.m. So we, you know, that was another special consideration for this type of an install. So we had no impact. Um, you know, staff would leave for the end of the day, come back the next morning, and like elves, we had done our work and no one uh, was uh, interrupted or disrupted. So that was another, you know, unique characteristic just dealing with the improvisation of not realizing that there were walls where the drawings didn't show walls and, and accommodating the, the special schedule of the construction and, and the optimization of the network as well. Yeah, certainly we had to, you know, um, as they alluded to, on the fly changes to the design as we saw cable routes that didn't exist or we had to go through uh, limestone in the building, um, we had to reroute uh, where we were going to run cables, we had to run where there was HVAC and some um, 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 fire uh, uh, piping. Um, there's areas where we had designed with an Omni. We couldn't get the coax to that location, so we were hitting that area with, uh, with a panel. So uh, we had to do a significant amount of testing and verification for these modifications that were happening on the fly. So that certainly uh, kept you on your toes. And maybe hiding a few antennas so they didn't bother the displays and the, the, the whole experience for the guest. And, and, right. So I think all the antennas had to be approved. Um, right. We had to paint antennas, yep. uh, obviously, to, to stealth them. Um, another uh, problem we had was that the head end is in what they'll call the West Pavilion. Um, I think we'll maybe see a layout of the facility. Um, there was no way to get fiber into the building and in a hybrid fiber coax system, that's important. So, um, so we actually had to run uh, the cable outside outside from the west uh, pavilion into the central pavilion where the, the majority of the DAS is installed. So that took a little, little uh, on-the-fly engineering as well. And I would encourage you, and I hope everyone here can uh, join us at the museum after this uh, panel, um, take a look as you walk into the entry areas and, and the, uh, the, the Great Hall and, and other areas. It's a very stealthy design. Uh, to, to the layperson, I, th I think you would absolutely not know that uh, this network existed except that, you know, Jerry could talk a little bit about some of the benefits now that the network's in. And I guess maybe I'll ask Jerry and, and again, Troy and, and, and Russ, um, let's talk a little bit about the network. Um, the network was um, first uh, brought into service earlier this year. It's been optimized and as, as Troy mentioned, it's 
meeting or exceeding the coverage and, and the uh, throughput uh, for LTE. But um, now that it's in, let's talk a little bit about some of the benefits and the things that the museum is going to gain uh, from this. Um, well, I have, wife, or I have uh, cellular coverage in my office now, so <laughs> that's a good plus. Um, and, and I've heard that anecdotally from other, uh, uh, one of the people I work with recently said, hey, I got a phone call while I was in the garage. That's, that's never happened before. And, um, thank you. And, and, but, but really, I mean, it's, it's not about me getting, getting coverage. It's, it's about what we can do with that for our guests. And, and there's really a couple of ways this is going to help us out. Um, social media is big. Everybody, everybody, you know, that, that, uh, social knows social media and how powerful that is. Um, kids live by the devices in their hands and being able to interact with the museum, interact with each other and interact socially over, over uh, external media is very important. But more than that, with, with systems like this now we can start going down the road of improved wayfinding. Instead of a static map in your hand or a static map on the wall, now, now we can um, start to look at the ways that we can interact with the digital devices that people carry and how to get them from point A to point B. Um, it, it, those devices can interact with, with uh, museum exhibits. We, over the summer, had one where there was a little bit of, of augmented reality that was done with, uh, with customer devices. They, they took out their Android or their iPhone and interacted with the exhibit. Um, and these are things that we we couldn't do without uh, some sort of digital infrastructure. So the, the, our digital initiatives are very important and this type of system is really gonna to help push us to be able to be the leaders that we are in, in this environment. That's great, Jerry. I, I just wanted to point out a couple of things. This is a, a neutral host network or an open network as we try to call it and as we refer to it. So it's open for all the wireless carriers, built for all the wireless carriers, built at once, add amplifiers, uh, everything else is, is pretty much fixed. We provide, Exynet provides a complete commercial wireless solution for MSI. So it's a one-time done type of scenario. We're managing the carrier relationships. We have relationships, existing relationships with all the carriers, simply passing that through as part of our position in the industry. So we're able to bring all these bits and pieces, if you will, as, a, as an independent third party to MSI so that they have no cares, no worries about the wireless network, and they can sleep at night and worry about Tesla coils and all kinds of other wild and crazy things they have going on at the, at the museum. Exonet's also local here to Chicago. We're just outside of, uh, of Chicago itself and Lyle, and we have a nationwide presence. So not only are we close to MSI, but we have networks all over the United States and Canada for that matter with all the all the carriers on and with agreements with each one of the carriers so bringing each one of those things to bear helps us create really long-term value for our clients and our customers in this case uh, we really value that relationship we try to go to extraordinary means to satisfy their needs their requirements these are all part of our values and our vision statement that we carry through which includes everything from caring about employees to caring about the actual commitment to the community. So we bring all these things to a, an, an entity like MSI who also has similar value standards they, that work in the education industry and, and all of those areas to better, better represent and present to the community. In summary, I'd just like to say from Exynex standpoint, we're really pleased that we're working with MSI and it's actually a lot of fun. I mean, right down to the crazy old drawings that we could put on the wall, but uh, there's like all kinds of neat stuff going on from Tesla coils dating back to an old U-boat that they sunk in the dirt and now built, a, built a, a roof over it. So we're really pleased to do that and we're really pleased at working with the wireless carriers to onboard them onto this wonderful system that you get to experience a bit later on. Thanks, Russ. And you know, I'll add one thing. You I hadn't planned to say this, but another benefit I think for the museum is that the network's in, it's operational, um, services being provided, and as Jerry said, it's um, greatly enhanced over what existed in the facility before. Extenet's also monitoring that network 24 by 7. We have on-site spares and uh, we have uh, rapid response teams if there are any issues. So the museum doesn't have to worry about any of this. It's taken care of 
you know, in perpetuity uh, for the museum and uh, Exonet will work with the carriers to keep the technology refreshed and upgraded as carrier technology changes over, over time as well. So again, delivering a complete solution and allowing the museum to focus on the things they want to do and bring this digital benefit to their, uh, to their patrons. And, and Jerry, just maybe um, any one last comment. Uh, um, we talked earlier and in, in talking with uh, some of the other executives at the uh, museum, my sense is you guys are really happy with the result. You've, you've had it in place now, you're getting the benefit and, and, and the experience has been a, a good positive experience. Yeah, it has been. Um, uh, definitely from, from comments I've heard, comments that the, um, from both our, our other employees and from our guests, it's been a, it's been a great experience. Um, what, what, uh, what was delivered is absolutely what we needed. Um, the, the fact that, uh, as you alluded to, that, that Xtonet's managing the system for us, so it's not something that my limited staff has to worry about trying to maintain. It's, uh, it's, it was a win-win for us. Thank you. We, we have a few minutes. We don't want to delay getting folks out of the room and to buses and cocktails and, and hors d'oeuvres, but uh, if there are any questions, we do have a few minutes. If any questions at all, we can uh, have the panelists here and, and the floor is open. I'm sorry, could, I couldn't quite hear the question. We have one carrier in service and uh, one carrier that we're in the process of working to bring onto the network and I think a couple more that we're in dialogue with through our uh, business development team. Any other questions? Bunch of we have a, question over, a couple of questions over <laughs> on this side. Polite audience. Just curious how important uh, Mr. Goes now as the vendor? Was it primarily price? Was it capabilities? Um, and what other alternatives were considered? Great question. I'm going to maybe let uh, Ross and, and Troy talk about that. I, I think you, you know you, you kind of hit on it. There's a, there's always a balance we're looking at between delivering the right customer experience, both for the carrier customer and for in this case the venue and also um, the economics and uh, I know considerations like um, scalability, um, the robustness of this solution, the, its adaptability to future needs were all considerations. But I'll, I'll let Troy and, and Russ uh, talk about that a little bit as well. Just adding on to that, Tim, I think it's very important, at least from our perspective, that our carrier customers accept the product line that will be deployed in any of our networks. Uh, I mean, there are customers, we need to listen to our customers and work very closely with them. Of course, the, the, the product, the Corning product was fit right in and, and I think the modularity actually, Troy, that you mentioned is a very, very strong part of it, being able to grow it as more and more carriers came on. Because we did have one anchor carrier joining before the others, uh, yet we do have some more queued up, just like uh, Tim said. And, uh, you know, some markets, some carriers prefer dedicated amplifier versus shared. We offer uh, both, but um, in this particular venue, the lower power approach uh, worked out well. We couldn't run um, coax from a centralized location or out of a bigger, you know, one or two watt box um, because of limitations. So having kind of a distributed node architecture um, with shorter cable runs to hit 103 antennas was a, was a good approach. And let me just add to, this is a great network. Uh, we've enjoyed working with Corning and we have other networks.